ties it all together for me is this kind of uh, philosophy and ethos of, you know, you know, authenticity, you know, um, really playing music that like touches you in a deep and personal way that can connect with people in a very like true and honest way. Hello and welcome back to this week's episode of the TF Cast. I'm Willis. Hey Grum here. It is October 4th here in the Solarium. And I am your host Jacob Bases. Today with us we have three quarters of the group Burn Vault here to uh, announce their upcoming album. Well not announce but talk about their upcoming album and some shows coming up. So I'm going to kick it right off to guitarist, vocalist and local radio host at KMSU Punk Rock Tom. Um, Tom? Aloha. Uh, tell us about the rest of the band and what's up. Hey, thanks for uh, having us on, first of all. That's cool. Yeah, so I'm Punk Rock Tom. Um, I do a lot of stuff around here in Mankato, have for a while. Uh, like I said, I'm with KMSU. I'm one of the World Beat hosts for a little show called Music Without Borders. Um, been doing that for a while. Uh, a bunch of a jack of all trade. And uh, sitting off here uh, to my side is Joe Riska, otherwise known as Joe Vampire. <laughs> Um, been uh, making music together with uh, Joe here, what, some seven, eight years, something like that? Yeah, I believe it's pretty close to that. But yeah, no. yeah, but me, me and Joe, we go way back. Um, we did the ethnic studies program together, like, mm-hmm. through MSU, so um, have our academic skills and stuff mm-hmm. going, too. And then uh, we got Mark over here, Mark Krogman. He is our newest member of our band here, and um, he is uh, an amazing bass player. Really great guy all around, and um, a man about town now in a lot of different bands and a lot of different projects, and um, was also the uh, producer and uh, recorder and producer of our album. Oh, yeah. He did by far most of the work on this. <laughs> all of this. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And um, our drummer, Joe Smith, is not able to be here with us today. He is sleeping because he works overnights. Poor, poor Joe. Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. Hey, Joe. Wish you could be here. Right? Yes. So, it would be cool. uh, where are things at with the project then right now? Uh, it sounds like you're getting ready for an, an album release. Why don't you just let people know kind of what's going on with that right off the top? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, right off the top, we are going to be having uh, two album release shows here at the end of October. The first one is on the 27th, that's the Friday, going on at the Enchanted Muse. It's uh, a part of uh, what's called uh, the Day of the Punks Not Dead. This is the Day of the Punks Not Dead 2. And uh, so we are playing that show with the Thirsty Giants, which... That's a fun return uh, for Holden Perrin. Uh, the, uh, I guess you could say the Perrin family is uh, yeah. doing a bit of a return here. Uh, Holden's been off in uh, Duluth doing some pretty cool stuff, um, doing his college gig up there. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is going to be his uh, first show coming back uh, for kind of the Halloween break. And uh, we're going to be doing two shows with them, actually, this night and the next night um, with the Thirsty Giants. And uh, Mary Jam from Minneapolis, they are coming down. They are a really awesome surf punk, uh, riot girl-esque kind of rock band that just rules. And such a great group of people. And then um, Moles, really good friends of ours. Um, Moles has a lot of history with, um, I guess, you know, the music that Joe and I have been making, um, uh, James Peeper from that group used to be in um, the band The God Awful Bastards um, with Joe and myself from way back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, his group, Moles, is really awesome uh, punk rock stuff. And um, then we got Sludge. Um, I'm excited to get to see them because every time I've tried to go to one of their shows, I always end up coming in like five minutes late before they just like end up finishing their set. So, um, they're a pretty rocking band and we're excited to, uh, be having them on the bill as well too. Um, all that stuff kicks off at six o'clock on Friday, the 27th, um, 10 bucks to get in. Um, we're going to be having our record there and available, um, which will be available on, uh, Vinyl and I believe also is it the CDs you think are going to be ready too for that? Yep. Okay, yep. They're cool. ordered. They're in manufacturing right now. They should be here just in time. Cool. Yeah, yeah. And then we uh, also do have a digital um, versions of the album available too. Um, we just had the release of our single 
on, uh, oh gosh, I think last Friday. Yep, it was last Friday. Side one, track one, you know, might as well start strong, right? Exactly. Sweet. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so uh, that's our track, uh, Dear Landlord. That's pretty much out on basically all the streaming it's services everywhere. out there. Yep. So, cool. yeah, easy enough to find if you want to look for it. So, What's the uh, the process like of uh, getting a, a vinyl record pressed? Uh, last time we had a guest who was doing vinyl, they said that they had some pretty hefty uh, lead times on that because of distribution stuff. What's your experience been like uh, getting the vinyl pressed? All right, so uh, I kind of had a bit of an in. I've been friends with uh, Stephen Williams, who's run In It Records for... I think about 24 years now, but he doesn't want to admit it's been 24 years because his first release was like a ska comp and now he just does like black metal releases. So, mm-hmm. you know, and he, he did when he was a senior in high school. Uh, I love in it records. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But uh, he turned me on to uh, A to Z merch and their subsidi- subsidiary solid, uh, solid merch. Mm. And, uh, we were able to put it in in mid-August, and right now the records are through customs, so mm. we should get it in a couple days. So mm. only about six, eight weeks uh, time between getting all the files over and getting the records back. So thankfully that uh, we have not yeah. run into that. And you got a test one here too, test print. Is that that <laughs> I is? guess you oh, could say of. it's more like a prop. Uh, <laughs> yep. So there we go. That's, okay. like a, that's some See sick that if you're art. looking on the yeah. uh, the video version of the podcast. Who, who put here. that together? So the uh, art for this was done by Justin Burgo. Hey, uh, oh, he's yeah. done art for like Fantasy Flight Games, Surly Brewing. He kind of okay. does. He does monsters. That's what he loves to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've played, you know, tabletop games with uh, Burgo for a long time, Uh, known him forever, and he's a great guy, and he was one to uh, let us use this art of a phoenix, which uh, I I think kind of says a lot about kind of where this record even came from. Uh, say more all right so this band kind of started uh not as a continuation of god of of god awful bastards because it really was a hard reset um what happened is we were all ready to go to finally re- like record and release an album of new material uh, at the at, end of yep, March, as the god awful bastards, yep, as yep. god awful bastards, in March 2020, we were going to go out to Sioux Falls, had the studio all mm. time all ready to go. We had taken the time off work. We we're ready to spend a few days there, and uh, yeah, the entire world shut down mm-hmm. in March. Um, yeah, it was like literally the weekend coming up. We're going to go over to my friend's place where we're going to be recording. Yeah. Yeah. It was, we just got skunked with it. It, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It, it, It was definitely a trying moment for us as a band. And, um, you know, we, we got to practice and, you know, get together like a few times, you know, kind of safely throughout the pandemic. And, um, you know, we, we just kind of had to try and make do and, you know, kind of like Joe was saying, you know, like kind of like when we were able to finally start getting back together and start getting serious about doing stuff again, we just kind of took a look at the world around us and we're like, you know, now feels like a time to go in a different direction with all this. Yeah, just completely different because I mean, we were playing like power violence, grindcore type of music. It was very, very fast, loud, in your face, aggressive, a lot of kind of screw you to the audience, mm. which, you know, <laughs> getting back out there and playing shows now, just the way it feels, mm. I don't think I could feel good about myself playing, you know, screw you audience kind of material now because everyone is so genuinely happy to be out and going to shows and to be Mm. playing music. So we kind of thought that might be the case too. And, you know, we want to do something just kind of going back to our punk rock roots. So, uh, very early March of 2022, we just started from nothing 
Mm. And uh, where we are now, we're already ready to uh, release our first album. Sure, and that that came with some lineup changes. Like, uh, Mark, yeah. how how did you how did you come to be associated with the Burn Vault? Well, the um, uh, twenty twenty two, I entered the forty eight hour band challenge. Sorry, it was the sixty hour band challenge that year. Yeah, um, uh, for the Minnesota Original Music Fest, and uh, Tom and uh, our drummer Joe were both uh, involved with that. Joe was a judge. Tom was one of the organizers. And the day of the challenge, um, I. Uh, was asked by Shelly Pierce, local legend from Soft Shuffle Function, if I was in a band on behalf of those guys on the panel. And uh, they asked me immediately following the challenge uh, if I wanted to come down and uh, check out their band and play with them. I met up with them that Sunday, and I think I was in the band pretty much immediately. Like, it just worked. Um, yeah, very... Uh, very good fit between their musical style and what I'm able to do on bass, and uh, they seem to appreciate it. And uh, yeah, but what was it? A couple months later, we had our first show. Uh, yep. Less than a year after that, we're releasing yeah. our first album. Yeah, our so. first show was October 28th last year, I believe. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Was there. Yeah. Cool. It was. It was a very um, fateful thing um, running into uh, to Mark at this event too. Um, you know, cause like, you know, like your wife is <laughs> like my former yes. boss <laughs> yes, from, uh, true. this, this organization yeah. that I worked for. And so I see Abby there and she's like, oh yeah, yeah. Mark, Mark's in, uh, in the competition. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, you know, name to the face and all this finally, you know, cause she had been talking to me for a few years, um, about her husband who, um, who's a musician and makes music at home and all this. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> so name to the face, you know, all this kind of serendipity just kind of like mm -hmm. all coming together, which was really cool. And, um, you know, like Mark said, I mean, like um we really like clicked together i mean like um it it just really seemed to like make like you know a lot of sense um just like musically everything really just was starting to really kind of fit together um you know and i think really kind of like early on in um the writing process i mean we could really tell that you know there was something kind of different happening with kind of the way that we were approaching just the writing of the music you know like uh there's there's you know actually a song on the record here that came from a bunch of like uh, street songs that I used to write and perform as a street performer, um, which is, um, I believe that's going to be our second single on this um, record, uh, the Johnny Thunder's Come Lately. And um, that was one that very early kind of came to mind as a song that we could be able to have and to work into the repertoire. And it was really cool to see how that went from this really kind of like acoustic punk kind of thing into a full band being able to support it and i think at that point was really when i as a musician and as an artist started seeing like you know this is going to be developing to something really really very cool and um yeah i don't know um just from that point like um everyone's been gelling together really well um the shows have just been awesome um, we've been playing more shows than um we played you know even as the god awful bastards and um that has been just a totally cool, totally great experience. Cool. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned it was like a kind of inspired by a little punk rock background. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of how you describe it? How else would you describe the style of the Burn Vault? We're punk. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's no. Yeah. Real, like, there's not even really a subgenre that yeah. it fits into. It's right. not it's oi. Just, it's not street yeah. punk. It's cool. not ska punk. You know, it's it's just straight up yeah. punk. Like that's what it is. There's well, a I mean, little bit of influence of all sorts of subgenres, but I would say know. exactly that. We've yeah. got little pieces of many of our songs that are direct sort of nods to other genres, but it all stays within that punk lane very neatly. Cool. Yeah. Is mm -hmm. there a lot of like modern inspiration, or is it mostly inspired by stuff from your past? Uh, you know, listening experience or band performance and whatnot. You know, I it's it's a good question. You know, because uh, my I guess my kind of like musical influences are pretty vast. Um, I guess that's one of the things with like uh, if anyone like listens to like my radio show program, they've they've got a pretty decent idea of the the fact that my radio show is very like vast in its scope. Um, so my my interests musically range um, just across genres and across different eras and I'm, I'm really interested in fusion points between different musical styles it's sort of like the confluence of when ideas come together and they um, cross-pollinate and then f make these new enriching kind of forms and so you know when I take a look at uh, things like 
punk and punk rock itself. Like I see it more as being like kind of like um, a grand spectrum of this kind of like underground independent music. Um, so many things come out of uh, the origin points of punk, but I think the one thing that really kind of like ties it all together for me is this kind of uh, philosophy and ethos of, you know, you know, authenticity, you know, um, really playing music that like touches you in a deep and personal way that can connect with people in a very like true and honest way. Um, there's a lot of different styles of music out there that have that kind of like vibe and energy to them. And so, I mean, there's a lot of different things that, you know, come into play. So, I mean, like with songs and stuff that like I kind of write and orchestrate, there's a lot of like, you know, kind of like standard, like kind of like, I guess you could say like, um, punk formats and stuff like this, but it's informed by a lot of different uh, ideas and thoughts and notions. Um, I, I like the music that I write and sing about to um, have a uh, content and meaning to it, uh, stuff that speaks to the human experience and um, kind of the world around us. So um, I guess it's kind of, um, there's a lot of different styles of music out there that have that kind of like vibe and energy to them. And so, I mean, there's a lot of different things that, you know, come into play. So, I mean, like with songs and stuff that like I kind of write and orchestrate, there's a lot of like, you know, kind of like standard, like kind of like, I guess you could say like um, punk formats and stuff like this, but it's informed by a lot of different uh, ideas and thoughts and notions. Um, I, I like the music that I write and sing about to um, have a uh, content and meaning to it, uh, stuff that speaks to the human experience and um, kind of the world around us. So um, I guess it's kind of like an overarching kind of thing, I guess you could say. Yeah. There's a lot of different things that kind of go into like the way that I think about writing and recording and just my approach with uh, music in general that's really informed by music from all around the world. Triple Falls is a media and event production company based in southern Minnesota. We specialize in multicam live streaming and sound and lighting for event productions. Contact us today to learn more or subscribe online to join our newsletter and stay up to date about events and things going on in the area. Thanks for tuning in. Back to your show. I think that a lot of times when people accuse punk rock of having kind of lost its muster, it's when some of that like informed, like kind of uh counterculture stuff starts to fall out of it like if there isn't mm -hmm. so much to like shout about like it's kind of like well we're angry that it's the 90s and 9 11 <laughs> hasn't happened yet like yeah, <laughs> yeah the movies sure. are too good <laughs> <laughs> for sure for sure um so yeah no, i know i i feel like that was because i i remember even just like like mid early, like mid early aughts, I felt like that was like a time when there was like a big resurgence, like the Bush years. People were like, oh, like we're once again going to do this more angry, shouty punk stuff. Or at least that's when it was coming like mainstream. Mm -hmm. I, I will say, though, I will give up all the good punk rock in the world if the world was better. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> I, think it's a fair I don't bargain. need the in <laughs> I don't need the inspiration that much, you know? <laughs> yeah, for um. sure. I mean, like for me, like musically speaking, um, so much of it, like I back back in kind of like the early 2000s when I was really like kind of coming into my own and really kind of getting into like um you know my experience with like local punk and punk from around uh, the community in the region I mean I, I was drawing a lot of in, um influence from things that people were doing around me and um you know I looked to like a lot of different bands. I mean like you talk about in it records you know and uh, there, there there were so many bands that um, got released on in it records that were things that were just um you know just absolutely like essential listening for me when I was coming up and um you know I I think it was a really unique time here like especially in the Midwest there was a some really cool experimentation that was happening with um, the art forms of like punk and post punk and what that meant kind of like in that moment in time um it, it was just a really interesting time to to be alive. Um, there there was a lot of different things that were happening um, that were pretty cool and um, pretty diverse. And um, yeah, just kind of went on to give me inspiration to do some cool things. But I mean, kind of getting to what you're saying about you know uh, punk rock, I, I I think that you know it's it's sort of like this challenging of the status quo and the norms because so often we can like kind of 
get stuck in the same old patterns and the same old ways of doing things that, you know, there's a good opportunity for one to turn a critical eye back on the kind of art and the community that you come from too, and to really kind of challenge the conventions that, that are there. I mean, like, um, take, take, for example, like our song, uh, boomer punks fuck off, <laughs> which is a, a, a great example <laughs> of that as well. Um, it's kind of in the spirit of, uh, um, there, there was this one song, um, I really love the band Refuse. Anyone knows me, knows that I have a deep love for the band Refuse. They wrote a song in uh, the late 90s that was called Circle Pit. And that song was essentially um, indignation of the way that uh, the current punk scene is. Um, uh, they kind of likened um, the Circle Pit of running around in a circle as, you know, kind of like uh, the, uh, what's it, the or- Ouroboros? Um, the uh, the snake yep. that's eating its own tail, yep. like eating itself in this kind of circle and this running around. And essentially it got to the idea of like, we're not really challenging norms. We aren't really challenging our own thoughts about what this community is supposed to be. Um, you know, it's just quite literally that the brand that you wear is the same as mine. And how can we be out of step when we're still in line? And um, it, in many ways, it was sort of like an indictment. Um, being thrown back at this community that was supposed to be progressive and inclusive and, you know, really kind of radically driven, kind of falling into this pattern of just repeating patterns that go on and go on and never stop. And I guess in that sort of a way, when I take a look at like what we wrote for um, Boomer Punk's Fuck Off, that in and of itself really was kind of an indictment in that similar kind of way. It's this idea that you know, there's there's kind of an older generation that's really into gatekeeping the community. You know, uh, lyrics, you know, such as uh, the, hey, nice, nice shirt, kid, name three songs, you know, like, and being antagonistic uh, to the youth. Um, those are things that never really sat well with me. I was never really into the idea of gatekeeping. I wanted to make sure that we were bringing people into the community and welcoming them because I remember being on the outside of that when I was coming up. And running into that gatekeeping and how that was really something that impeded my ability to be able to be fully involved in that community. There's also like mm-hmm. an irony because so much of early punk is like, why can't I find a place where I belong? I don't want to be like everyone else. And then it's a bunch of boomers being like, wait, why aren't you like everyone else? Like- <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That That's the spirit of it right there, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think we're kind of in a really interesting <laughs> oh shoot yeah. anyone want to answer that <laughs> I think it's it. God on the line it's the punk scene <laughs> yeah you you pissed off who yeah, is, the, uh, the guy boomers. at Boomer <laughs> <laughs> well it is a landline so please yeah. stop <laughs> long time caller or long time listener first time caller <laughs> long time caller first time listener yep. <laughs> yes I've seen some shows with people like that yep yeah You ever see that Mr. Show sketch, the pre-tape call-in show? No, that's, <laughs> I would like to, though. Oh, yeah. that's Wasn't that supposed to be coming back? Uh, it did for like six episodes, oh, okay. like seven it. years ago or okay. something like that. Oh, yeah. Did any of you happen to watch the Chris Gethard show? It's no. like kind of some deep mm. internet. It was like a, a call-in show where the only rule was they weren't allowed to do, use the same premise twice, except mm. once a year they would do Sandwich Day. And everyone would eat sandwiches. But otherwise, every episode had to be a different premise. It was pretty cool. Interesting. I love that. Yeah. I, I, back, back to the, the punk rock conversation. I, I, do, I do think that a lot of what you were just talking about with the gatekeeping and the like people finding a home in, in the movement does have to do with that kind of like counterculture and like unifying acceptance bit that was kind of the undertone of, you know, what started it. Um, Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we're at a really interesting time right now, I think, in popular music, because if you hear it, uh, you know, you, you hear this undercurrent that, oh, rock is coming back, pop punk is coming back. Um, and the thing is, so many people are just so against it. It's exactly like it was in the 90s, where it's like, oh, Green Day, Offspring, Bad Religion, Rancid. These guys are on the radio. You know, they're sellouts, they're posers, Blink-182, same thing. Now, 20 years later, you know, guess who's back doing the hugest 
tour they've ever done. You know, Blink yeah, One Eighty Two. <laughs> you know, you've got all these bands that are back, and then you've got Travis Barker, who is now partnering with all these other you know pop musicians who are coming out with you know kind of these rock pop punk albums and you see those same kids who are kind of gate kept in the 90s and early 2000s doing the same thing like no you can't get into the scene because you know you liked olivia rodrigo mm. uh you can't get in the scene because you know you heard uh you know the new stuff by Demi Lovato or I Machine was, Gun Kennedy. I was just going to say Kelly, that. I yeah. was just seeing some awesome stuff with Demi Lovato um, yeah. doing some pretty cool rock stuff. And I'm like, hey, right on, man. That's that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that doesn't that, that makes no sense, especially if you like like look back on some of the political issues that was brought into it. Anything that funnels people into those issues and makes them relatable, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, especially when marginalized people are kind of at the center center of like what our uh, political pushes in the upcoming campaigns in the next year. I, I think that, you know, having people have access to like a message of greater acceptance and like, hey, we need to do something to upend these things and make sure that people are accepted and our world is cared for, um, which I generally interpret as being the underlying message of most punk music. Um, I, I think yeah, that's a yeah. good thing. I, I would totally agree with that. I mean, you know, and I I, I would also, you know, state, you know, I mean, like, you know, take like groups like Rage Against the Machine, for example. Mm-hmm. I mean, they 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 face so many criticisms, you know, about being like sellouts for what they did, you know, in order to be able to get their message heard by a larger audience. But they also got their message heard by a much larger audience that brought in a lot more people um, that really kind of like pushed people into kind of like more kind of like you know questioning their upbringing and you know kind of presenting them with these um radical kind of like leftist ideas that otherwise wouldn't have been available to them um i think one of the uh, the greatest parts of and i i love this little anecdote <laughs> that i heard i believe it was about the song gorilla radio that there was a part in the song where uh, zach says uh, turn that shit up right mm-hmm. and so they convinced um the uh, the radio stations and their record producers that turn that shit up was actually like a um, a phonetic way of being able to say this Aztec word about you know like you know being there for your people, and this was something that allowed them to get by the censors, and it was just a way of them of punking the hell out of <laughs> out of their their own record companies and uh, these places, and they, yeah, they got away with that shit, and that's amazing, you know, or like how people are just all of a sudden figuring out that a uh, Lady Gaga song Poker Face was you know. That uh, the the chorus for that was not pa 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 poker face pa pa poker face, but it was pa pa poker face fa fa fucker face, and so that went out on the radio for pretty much every single radio station out there. And I look at those things like that, and I'm like, well, you know, this is a part of like culture jamming, but I mean, it's also an important thing that happens just beyond the simple idea of you know just uh, causing a little bit of like cavic, um, chaos and havoc. Um, within uh, those kind of like more established kind of traditions. I think it's a way of being able to kind of push us into like a, a different way of uh, looking at the world and the reality around us. Yeah, I mean, I, I think of a lot of it stems from just like people fighting so hard to like create these communities and then growing up with such a strong feeling of protection. And then as you age, that just kind of turns into like a, uh, uh, it turns into gatekeeping, but it's more like you like are protecting it and you like don't want to ruin this thing that you never had before. And now, like, especially so many people, things like punk and metalheads, like these things define whole people's lives. And so, yeah, I, yeah. I have this I have the same feeling, though, like uh, if the next like big math rock guy for example which is what i like to listen to if the next big math rock guy picks up a guitar because machine gun kelly because like some girl at school had a crush on machine gun kelly i don't care if that's why it started like what i don't know it's just it's just weird if we can get like punk and alternative music in the eyes of young people that's how we get young alternative artists i don't know and that's why we've been you know, really cognizant of playing so many all ages shows. Uh, yeah, it's really important to us uh, just because, you know, we know that uh, kids are really clamoring for just something new and live experiences. And uh, mm. I remember, you know, 
being 14, 15, uh, going to local shows, you know, either at the skate park or uh, the Indigo at MSU or, you know, all these other kind of places that are out of the way and just seeing bands that, you know, really like things that you'd never been exposed to at all. And all of a sudden these experiences, like they change your life. Mm. Uh, you know, I mean, I probably wouldn't be playing music if I hadn't, you know, been going to these shows. So I, mean, it does literally do a lot and it can mm. make you feel accepted and really give you a place. Do and, you, have like a story or anecdote like from that period of time that you know made you want to pick up a guitar or like go down this path oh man oh god i got so many of those myself i mean like what you know i i look back on like um wild shows that i used to go to um when i was coming up and um the scene that i came up in was um the aberdeen south dakota punk scene you know which um was quite a bit of like you know a, a circuit of things that was going on um here in the midwest kind of during that early 2000s um so i mean like uh bands like a uh, flat earth conspiracy um from here in mankato back in the day and bands like a line um who were playing um i don't know when this airs but this friday um they're uh, they're playing at the nakato again Th- those are bands that came through on the regular um to my home community and uh they were some of the first bands that really got me interested in going like oh what's going on in this place called mankato like there's some cool bands that are coming out of here um there were other cool bands from places you know like saint cloud um marshall um down through brookings and sioux falls and sioux city and minneapolis and so all of these like kind of kids were just all really interested in making some new awesome music and just having these experiences together. I mean, like I remember like having shows that like I threw in my tiny little town that I was neighboring by in a little town called Falkton, South Dakota, um, at a, um, um, uh, it was a Masonic temple, you know, and I, I was having bands from like Fargo and from Sioux Falls that were coming down to these um, to play in just the middle of nowhere. And we, we were just having a blast and just having so much fun. But I mean, there some of the instances that I think of, I, I think of like the infamous show in Aberdeen where uh, Examination of the, they were this post-hardcore band from Sioux Falls. They came down and um, they they were just utterly destroying this um, this place when they were playing. Um, their, their drummer got completely naked during their show and threw his underwear out in the crowd and it like wrapped around my face and I was just like, you know, getting steamed by this guy's sweat. And I was like, oh my God, this is insane. <laughs> and this is right across the corner from like the police station. And the police came and broke up the show <laughs> and they're looking for this guy, you know, was running around naked, you know, at this all ages punk show. And um, the uh, the guitarist takes the rap for it because um, the uh, drummer is um, got a warrant out for his arrest. And so they're ending up having to like get the hell out of town. And it, it was just a wild chaotic time but it was something that like i look back on it as being just like a, a really really interesting moment and something that opened my eyes up to being like you know i don't necessarily have to go to like some big crazy rock show to have like an experience that i can say oh my god this was an absolutely like amazing time because it truly was but it was something that just you know blew my mind um, quite literally. And, you know, I, I still have the album from that show today and I still listen to it. And I remember what the experience was of getting to see this band and just how much it inspired me to like, you know, not necessarily like get up and get naked on stage and like throw my underwear on the crowd. But, um, <laughs> it, um, what it got me thinking about was like, how can I, as a musician and an artist be able to put every single ounce of everything that I have into every single performance, And that's the lesson that I took from so much of this is that those artists that put it all out there for you on the table, those are the ones that are memorable and that change people's lives. And I think that's, I have so many of those stories, but that's the one that really sticks out. You got something, Mark? Mm. I was going to say, where, where was, uh, where, what was your musical, uh, like upbringing? Like, well, I can tell you, I have a pretty, pretty, uh, well, relatively different background than every other member of the mm-hmm. band, I'd say. Um, I didn't grow up in the Mankato area. Um, I lived all of them down the East Coast. Uh, my father was in the military. And I 
have basically no bounds to what type of music I listen to and enjoy playing. Um, so this is actually the first I would call truly punk band I've been in, even though I've played lots of punk rock over my time. Um, but uh, actually kind of stepping back just a little bit, I would say these guys definitely did a good job of not gatekeeping me when it came to jumping into the band, where I'm, I'm not a punk, I'm not a hippie, I'm not really any one thing as far as what I like to do musically, but I never felt excluded by these guys for not being like, a hardcore punk local guy, you know, they let me come into the band to do my own thing. And it's been absolutely incredible. Um, but as far as what, uh, inspired me musically, I, uh, during high school in, in, uh, I lived in Dubuque, Iowa, and I would, uh, go to Iowa city, Iowa to see many shows and a formative moment was definitely seeing David Yao of the Jesus lizard, like monkey barring across the rafters of the ceiling in Gabe's, um, just like like Tom was saying, giving everything he had to that performance and seeing that like the effect it had on the crowd and like how committed he was to his art was just, well, it's inspired me ever since. Um, yeah, I guess probably many other uh, early on experiences I can't think of the details of at the moment, but uh, um, yeah, from a very early age, I've been listening to everything from punk to classical to, you know, ska and reggae and, you know, you name it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, even though I, I don't never would have considered myself a punk or any one type of uh, musician, it's definitely something that I fell into and loved uh, immediately. Yeah. Yeah, you're like mostly in heavy projects nowadays. Yeah, yeah, no, I've funny. always loved heavy music in general, um, just not necessarily specifically punk. Um, but you know, I'll play anything heavy, just let me do it I'll like do yeah <laughs> yeah for anyone who doesn't know mark went from last year having he wasn't in any local projects and now he plays in a project with me uh which is like totally different than this it's like jazz fusion jam jam sort of, music yeah. and then he also plays with Lodi, and he was in none of these bands or really even knew anyone in these bands before he did yeah i don't challenge didn't know anybody that i'm now playing with um a couple of years back like i had met eli previously from Quantum yeah Games. yeah i knew eli um, but didn't really know him. I hadn't really spent much time with him. Um, yeah. I'd love to... Uh, oh, sorry. Did you have another... Oh, I was just going to say I've been making music that whole time. I was just sort of holed up in my uh, yeah. home studio doing it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd love to get into... This is the first record you've produced, correct? It is. Indeed. Uh, yeah. I'd, I'd love to get into some of the meat and potatoes of what that was like and what the process was like sure. doing that for sure. the first time. So, um, yeah. It's unreleased yet, but I do have another album I've produced, but it's just not finished yet. And that's my solo work, which I do plan on eventually putting on stage here, hopefully. Um, but the Burn Vault album is the first album where we've actually, I, from the beginning to the end, I was there, had hands on every step of the process, um, including the mastering and shipping it off and everything. So, um, but we recorded entirely asynchronously, asynchronously for this album. In other words, we were we never recorded two parts that are on the album that you're hearing together at the same time. Uh, we recorded drum, drums at Joe's place. We recorded Tom's guitar in the vault. Uh, Joe Vampire recorded all his guitars at home, and I recorded the bass at my, my, my home studio as well as all the vocals. Fortunately, that is the one sort of semi-pro piece of kit I have is the ability to record vocals in a nice studio with some really good mics, uh, which I hope comes across on the album. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so it was all uh, taking all those bits and pieces from very, like, I don't know how many recording sessions total we did. It had to be in the 20s um, mm -hmm. for the number of individual times where I had to get together with somebody and record. So I'm taking all those various parts and piecing them back together into something that I hope sounds like something we played together and has that the the live energy that we have as a band because it is... I think something that's really distinct for us is like we have a very powerful live sound and I really wanted that to come through on the album. Mm. I, I hope I pulled it off. Uh, like like Grum said, this is the first time I've done it. So it's um, I, I think I'm doing a good job, but I really uh, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm an amateur, um, but I, I'm definitely not quite at the pro level. Um, so it's been mm. a lot of education uh, to get to the point where we could actually ship this thing off to press vinyl and we're going to be putting it up online in a matter of a couple weeks. Um, but the, uh, yeah, didn't make much money doing it, but I got a lot of education in the process and feel really prepared cool. now to, uh, produce music for pretty much anybody. Hmm. So cool. is that something you're going to start doing around here? I hope so. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'd love to work with uh, many people. I have a couple people that I might be working with soon, hopefully, and hopefully, uh, some things developing with the studio, but we'll have to wait and see on that. But yeah, um, definitely interested in recording, um, from here on out really. Yeah. Cool. 
Awesome. Well, one thing you said you wanted to talk about uh, before the show uh, was uh, where the name came from. Oh, yes. Uh, mm-hmm. For the Burn Vault. Uh, what's that? Yeah, I, I guess I could speak to some of this. I, yeah. I was the one that kind of initially came up with the idea for uh, for this band name, and I floated it out of band practice. This was before Mark was um, in the project here. But um, so I guess... <sighs> So it goes back really to our, our good buddy, uh, Edgar Byrne. And uh, Edgar, um, good friend of mine, um, long friend of mine here in Mankato, was a part of the, uh, the KMSU radio family. And anyone that's a part of KMSU knows that, like, we, we are truly an extended family. Like, everyone's kind of looking out for each other. I mean, when we have our pledge drives, it's like everyone comes together. It's like a big family reunion thing. And it's kind of weird because, like, when you think of pledge drives, they kind of suck. <laughs> you know, when you're, like, listening to, like, NPR and stuff like this, like, oh, my God, it's not the pledge drive again. Like, they're just going to be interrupting and talking about this stuff all the time. I, I, I never get the the impression of that when KMSU does it. When, when it happens at KMSU, it becomes this whole, like, big thing. And the whole community comes together, not just the people at the radio station, but the whole community as a whole. And I love that. And um, Edgar, like, really was a huge part of that and a huge part of our music community going straight back into the 80s. Um, He was a big part of uh, the early punk scene here um, in Mankato, a big part of the skateboarding scene here in Mankato, a big part of the art community in Mankato. And, you know, uh, he's just a titan. And, you know, he developed cancer and, you know, had a stage, I think a stage four cancer just for like, what, at least like a decade, close to a decade. Yeah, he lived with pancreatic cancer for a decade, which Mm. is basically unheard of yeah just just unheard of and you know he he ended up passing away a few years ago right before the pandemic happened and um the burn vault um and consequently um the god-awful bastards before that um we were invited to um have a practice space at this place that edgar had secured in the 1990s um, which was always known as the vault and um, you know, we had kind of been wanting to get in there for a while. I know that um, in some of your previous bands that you had done some <coughs> jamming and stuff down there before that, too, yeah. kind of like in the um, early 2000s, too. Yeah, that was the uh, Old Town Ghost practice yep. location. And, and yep. to be clear, this is an actual vault that oh, we yeah. practice in. There is a <clears throat> locked vault door you go through to get into the space. Yep, yep. yep. Yeah. So it is actually a vault. And so... Um, you know, so we ended up um, securing a spot in there. Edgar really loved the god awful bastards and loved what we were doing <laughs> and just the vision that he had for it. So, um, and we were really struggling at the time to be able to keep and secure a practice space around here. I mean, we were quite literally hopping all over southern Minnesota. Yeah, you know? there were. I think five different practice spaces in four years. Yeah. Uh, after that fifth oh. one, I actually left the band. I was like, all right, that's it. I'm done. It's no. cursed. <laughs> I'm walking away. Oh, yeah. No. Just cut our losses. Let's be done. And of course, you know, nine months later, I'm like, hey, guys, I haven't found anyone to play with. What, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> yep. And kind of by that time, we had already gotten like back into the vault. And now we had this more secure spot. And, you know, it was just a really cool thing to be a part of this thing. And, you know, at the time, I think it was ourselves and um, Lodi was um, in that space at that time, too. Um Gosh, I'm trying to think of who else was yeah. in that uh, space. My bomb was in there with you guys. Yep, for a uh, little bit. War Rooster. Yeah, War Rooster. Was there at that time. Yeah, War Rooster was yeah. still in there. Yeah, I think it was technically Let It Breathe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Even, even, yeah even Let It Breathe. That was yeah. before uh, Let It Breathe became Lodi. Um, so, I mean, like, this was going on. Then the pandemic happens, and then things get really kind of quiet there. And, you know, but then all of a sudden all of these other folks start moving into the different rooms that are down in the basement of this place. Yeah, and me included. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and all these musicians start showing up down here at um, you know, at the mm-hmm. building, and it becomes kind of like, um, I, I've referred to it as sort of like the city sound of Mankato. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if anyone knows what city sound is, it's this practice space in Minneapolis, if you don't know what it is. And it, it's just this really cool place where um, artists and musicians have been able to come together and, you know, we kind of like, you know, 
you know, rub el like rub elbows with each other as we're coming in and out and people get interested and like, Hey, what are you doing in your room over there? And like, yeah. what are you doing? You know? And you know, it's just been a cool way for people to interact with each other and to create this kind of like cool, like art and music community. Yep. And it's just been awesome to see this whole thing develop. I would, I would legitimately say it's the single biggest resource for Mankato's music community. Yep. It's it, the- like, it's like the resource. It's the reason I'm in three bands now after just finding these guys. Yeah. I was in the yep. other two yep. bands within a matter of months just from the connections I made down there. Yep. It's also something I wanted to mention about the recording for the album. Uh, once we got sort of main, like everything tracked out for the album, we had the idea to try and get as many people as we could from the building we practice in. The Chestnut to, Squares. Uh, the Chestnut Squares <laughs> uh, to, uh, yep. to contribute to the album in some way. And we have a track called One to One about police brutality. And we got as many people as we could to shout the one-to-one part of the song. And so we ended up with, let me think it's, hopefully I don't miss anybody here, but it's uh, B-Bomb Fields, Beulah Rue, Onion Bun, Soul Folk Union, Lodi, and the Quantum Mechanics, and a couple other extraneous people. I think that's cool. everybody. I hope I didn't forget everybody. So they're all on the album right, yeah. shouting along with us in that song, which I think is fantastic. Um, then we were also to get a couple horn. We also able to get, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple horn players from down there, Connor yeah. and Abby, um, that are playing on the closer of the album, which is one of my favorite tracks. Uh, yeah, probably truly, my favorite track of the and album. Just truly, those guys it's so up. long. It's, yeah. it's long, but it's worth it. it. Is. I love <laughs> it. I, I, I've uh, I've had I've heard some I've heard these mixes. Yes. Uh, just uh, me and Mark are kind of both like coming up in our mm-hmm. engineer careers, so it's it's fun to have him. And uh, just as something to add context to what you're saying, Tom. I like wait right when I became a musician, like right before I knew how to do anything, hadn't booked any shows. I had even heard of the vault and like I'm a little bit younger than you guys and just like didn't know. Now I'm friends with that whole crowd. But the vault has like uh, it's a, it, there's like it's like a folklore in Mankato. Like it, it always has kind of been this place where if you're a musician, you got to know about the vault. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and to kind of bring it you know back to to the original question here you know about the origins of the band name i mean that's really where it comes from and you know i i came into the vault one day and we we're talking about different band names and i said you know i i i had this thing that kind of occurred to me why don't we call this like burns vault or the burn vault and joe and i kind of talked about this and we we're like you know the burn vault is I, I think you said like right away like this is the band name yep and we, yeah. we had like, you know, a few, and um, it, as straight up, it was a tribute to Edgar Byrne for Byrne's mm-hmm. vault. And, you know, we, we decided, you know, you know, we want to talk to like people that, you know, that he loved and that cared about him and just talk to them about, you know, this is what we want to like call this band. And this is the project. This is the idea behind everything with the project itself. Like, what do you think about this? And we went to some of the folks that were like the, the, the closest of the close people of uh, in Edgar's life. And um, they were just completely touched by that. And I think it really sent a really strong message to us that, yeah, this is going to be our band name, but this is also very much a tribute to his memory and this whole idea about building art and music in Mankato and to help that to grow and thrive. And um, I kind of see that personally, you know, as like a part of like my life story here in Mankato as well, too. Um, I'm trying to do a lot of that with the development of the art and the music community through my philanthropy here in Mankato. Um, Not only just through like the music that we do, but also um, through uh, my interaction with different things that are going on in the community. I'm pretty involved with things that are happening at the all ages venue in town at uh, the Enchanted Muse. But I'm also working on the development of a, a nonprofit organization that's going to be helping to support um, the Minnesota Original Music Festival right now that I'm working on with uh, Eli and a few other different uh, key players around here, too. So we're, we're in the midst of working on all of that right now, being able to bring music and art opportunities to southern Minnesota that um, brings in like a wide, diverse group of people from across the state kind of working together to create art and music spaces um, to let those things thrive. Hmm. Yeah. Well, is there, uh, anything that we didn't get to that anyone feels they want to say, uh, 
Hey, I got a little flyer right here. You can take a look at that. So hey. that that's, that's for uh, the 27th. Um, that's coming up. I didn't have time to print off the other one, but uh, the one on the 28th is going to be with the Thirsty Giants, and that's going to be at the Nakato Bar. And um, I know there's a lot of stuff going on that night, but you'll want to come out for that too. Mm -hmm. We'll probably push back our start time because I know that there's a, a metal show that's going on at the Enchanted Muse that night and then also the big uh, Halloween party at um, the Makerspace as well too. So um, we kind of have the opportunity of being kind of like uh, the post event, I guess you could say. So mm -hmm. yep. I guess what I'm saying to you guys right now, we, we should push back our start time on <laughs> that night. All right. We can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I are we voting? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. All right. We'll, we'll we'll talk to Jake down in the Cato about it. Yeah. Like um, he wasn't here to vote, so. Yeah. Well, uh, where should people go to find stuff about the Burn Vault, or if you also want to pitch like your personal handles or wherever you like people to contact you? Now is your time. Do not talk to me or my son ever again. Deal. Nah. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but really, though, uh, to find our stuff. Uh, probably because we're boomers, uh, we're most active on Facebook. So facebook.com slash the, <laughs> <laughs> slash the burn vault. Um, but we've also got our TikTok, which I believe is yep. at the burn vault. Uh, we have our YouTube page, which should have a new video coming up in the next couple of weeks yeah. for the, uh, dear landlord single. Yeah. We, Val, Val Perez is the one that helped uh, shoot that video. Yep, who yep. also helped out with God Awful Bastards. Uh, One of the founding members of the Bastards. Yep, mm -hmm. and also supplied us with, uh, I think, practice space number four. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, let's see here. Other places you can find We're us. On Instagram, too. Yep. Um, yeah, the, the TikTok account. Um, pretty much if you're looking for the Burn Vault um, on any of those social media platforms, yeah. you're going to be able to locate it. Um, mm. Yeah, so the, those are the places. I mean, we're also on Bandcamp too. That's the um, most important one. Yeah, yes. that's the most important one. Um, you can be able to uh, check out stuff from uh, the online store there. Um, you can pre-order the album there. Um, I think we've even got some links over to uh, the Threadless store. Is that through the Bandcamp page? I. Uh, no, I don't think they like it because uh, you can also of course. sell shirts on their platform. So. Mm -hmm. but, of course. <laughs> uh, the burnvault.threadless.com, that has all of the uh, various styles that you could get that we just can't afford to do multiple colors and sizes and everything. Yeah, he's you can get rocking. a nice uh, sweatshirt if you want, even. Yeah, he's cool. rocking one of the sweatshirts. You can yeah. get pillows and mugs, too, that, that I found. That's, that's kind of fun. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Well, thanks a ton, guys. Yep. Um, I'll probably see you very soon at the at this at the yeah. bowl. And uh, one last thing: uh, anyone who's interested or is even thinking about it, just get out there and start a band yourself. That's damn please. right. Yeah, it's easier to do than you think. Mm. You just need to have confidence, and some friends, mm. bang around. It's mm. a good time. And it's good for you to suck at first. Yeah. I mean, mm. because it's through the sucking that you actually develop yourself as an artist. And eventually, the sucking kind of falls away. It's like a vacuum, you know? It sucks, and then it enters a state of equilibrium, and then you're there! You're there. Yeah. That's I, great. I, I forget which of our great uh, philosophers from Adventure Time it was, but uh, they <laughs> said that, you know... Sucking is uh, the first step in being good. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it was, it was Jake. Yeah, yep. sucking is the first step to being sort of good at something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Perfect. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, guys. It was a pleasure, and Absolutely. we'll see you soon. Okay. Cheers. Cheers.